couple of small points. I have, for my sins, relinquished the duties of the Dublin Chamber of Commerce presidency about a month ago. So if you've got any complaints about litter in Dublin or um, Liam Kavanagh is your man, not me, uh, going forward. Um, Herb, it was a real pleasure to, uh, to follow on from you. Some of this you, you may know and some of it uh, you mightn't, but there are there's some strong commonalities for me uh, between uh, Aircom and, and indeed yourself. We shared a chairman for some time, um, uh, Ned Sullivan, chaired Greencore through much of the period that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, and we also share a, a history in that we were both at one point, uh, namely our businesses rather than ourselves, although it sometimes feels uh, like the latter, owned by the Irish state. And, the, uh, and that, uh, I think, brings with it a sense for many, many people in Ireland that they still own you and you get a level of scrutiny around your business, uh, which for the most part is interesting and helpful, but, um, but sometimes can be challenging too. Uh, when I was first uh, asked by Danny to come uh, and talk today, I had anticipated talking a little about green corn, a lot about the opportunities as I saw them in, for Ireland in food and agri going forward. But um, given what has uh, unfolded across the European food industry in the last seven weeks, um, I think, frankly, it wouldn't uh, uh, make any sense for me not to address uh, some of those issues explicitly, um, both in terms of what's happening, uh, what I think is going to happen, and what that will mean for the evolution of the, uh, of the flu food supply chain going forward. So um, I, do, um, I do want to get into that. But before doing so, I think it's, it's worth uh, describing a little where Green Corps comes from um, and why um, we are such an important uh, stakeholder in that uh, in the UK uh, and beyond. Uh, many of you will know, um, in fact, um, I think almost all of you who were in primary school in Ireland will know uh, the history of Green Corps. I certainly learned when I was in um, a primary school in Cork the names and locations of the four Irish sugar factories. And indeed, uh, we were the first um, high-profile case study as a business when we were privatized in, uh, in 1991. Um, our business has changed enormously since then. Um, the, I guess one, one test for that is that of the portfolio of businesses that we have today, less than 1%, in other words, less than 1% of our assets were part of the portfolio of assets that were privatized uh, by the Charles Sawhey government of 1991. So that will give you a sense for just the the fundamental new nature um, of the business that we have. And in the five years uh, that Olivia referred to in which I've been CEO of the business, we've changed enormously too. Uh, we have uh, sold 10 of our business units. Uh, we've acquired 10 more. Um, of the uh, 24 manufacturing sites that we have around the world, uh, 14 are new to our group um, in, the last, um, in the last five years. Um, of the 150 senior managers that we have in the group, uh, more than 60 are new to our group in the last 18 months. Um, we have a, uh, effectively a brand new board, a new chairman, uh, three new non-executive directors, and somewhat frighteningly, um, I am the second longest serving uh, director on the Green Corps Group board now. Um, and all of that has fed into the culture of the business that we have today. Uh, we've gone in that period from being a business whose heritage and culture was driven by being in a relatively slow-moving food ingredient sector uh, to being in a value-added, uh, fast-moving uh, convenience food sector. We've gone from being a business that was centered around the island of Ireland in terms of its trading interests to a much more international one. Uh, we've also, frankly, gone from being a business that had a sense of paranoia and a feeling that it was under attack uh, to one that's much more uh, balanced um, and mature and self-confident in how it looks at the world. Um, and we've gone from a business that was run in very, very narrow financial terms to one that's much more strategic and, uh, and developmental uh, in its focus. Um, and, and what that means is that we have um, uh, you know, a strong and growing business. We have, we'll have revenues this year of a little more than one and a half billion euro. Um, we'll have operating profits of over 100 million. Uh, we employ uh, 12,000 people, um, 11,500 of which are in the UK at peak. It makes us the largest Irish employer of people in the UK. Um, and when I think about the opportunities for growth in Europe, I'm very struck by the opportunities for, uh, for growth in the UK. We had like-for-like uh, -like growth in Britain last year of 7.5%. That's more than 100 million um, of organic growth um, in a very tough overall macroeconomic context. Um, and importantly for us, we're developing our business with the skills that we've built uh, in Ireland and in the UK, in the United States, and we've just, um, you know, we'll probably hit about a quarter of a billion dollars of revenue in the States this year. Um, and, you know, as recently as last month, we've signed up a, 
a multi-regional supply agreement with Starbucks, which will be the bedrock of what we do in America, I think, for, uh, for the next decade. The, the centerpiece of all of that is the food offerings that we've got. Um, we feed about 50 million people a week. Um, we provide more than 500 million sandwiches in the year. We do more than 200 million jars of cooking sauce. Uh, we provide uh, between three and four million families in Britain with their Christmas cake every year. Um, so we are right at the heart of the food consumption uh, occasion or set of occasions uh, in, the markets, uh, in the markets in which we operate. Um, and our business plays on very important um, and we think enduring changes uh, in, in consumer behavior. So one of those is the need for instant gratification or instant access to food. Um, you might not know this, but um, you know, between six and eight million people in Britain every day skip their lunch in order to work. Uh, eight in 10 of the workers uh, in the city of London consume their lunch at their desk. Um, they're the needs um, into, which, uh, into which we put our product. And we do that while recognizing some uh, quite profound uh, changes around healthy eating as well. So, you know, 50% uh, uh, of people when they choose their lunch in Britain today um, are looking for that occasion to deliver one of their five a day uh, fruit and veg requirements. And 40% of our consumers in the uh, food to go um, are, looking for, um, are looking for products that are either low calorie um, or low fat. Um, so that's the space in which we're in. We concentrate on delivering food into local markets. That's the unit of delivery um, by which the food value chain works. But importantly, the way in which we assemble that food is done on a much more regional or global basis. So we might provide um, you know, uh, 1.2 or 1.3 billion pounds worth of food into the UK, but we are sourcing that from 13 different EU countries um, and from 500 different suppliers. Um, including Ireland, where we source uh, more than uh, 100 million euro uh, worth of product a year. Um, it would be our second largest uh, source country of, of ingredients going in. So the security and integrity of the food value chain is absolutely critical, not only to our business, but to the type of industry um, in which we now sit. And that's why the impact and the changes and the challenges that have come to light around the food value chain in Europe is just so, so important to us and so, so, so important uh, to other players in the, in the global food industry. So what's happened here is that you've seen um, you know, three or four uh, pretty significant trends come together at one time. Uh, the first is the emergence of genuine, but I think relatively isolated, uh, criminality in the European uh, food value chain. Um, so it's driven by the fact that there is a legitimate uh, horse meat uh, slaughtering and horse meat consumption set of markets across Europe. Um, but that operates in a context whereby the product that comes out of those slaughterhouses sells at less than a fifth of the price of corresponding, uh, corresponding beef product. And that's created an incentive for uh, the criminal mislabeling of food, which in a global and, and multi-country supply chain um, has, um, has spread uh, widely across that. Alongside that, you've got a dramatic increase in, um, in species-specific testing uh, that has enabled all of us and all of the commentators on the food industry to get to grips very quickly uh, with what's going on. Um, and on top of that, all of this is happening in an environment over the last five years where the trust in institutions, be it regulators, be it governments, uh, be it large multinational companies, is at an all-time low. Um, and so those things together have fed through to some very, very significant changes which we think have unfolded and have uh, come to light in the last month. So the first is the massive erosion in trust in food. Um, and I choose each of those expressions carefully because the, the data on this does indicate that we're dealing with a massive erosion in trust in food. Um, it's never been as low as it is today. Um, that is, compounding that has been a loss of confidence individually and collectively across different players um, in the food supply chain. Um, and the consequence of all of that is that in the last month, there's been about a 40% drop in the purchase of processed beef. Um, so you've seen a massive switch. I think that will be somewhat temporary in nature, although the first two issues will run much longer um, in terms of the consumption uh, of processed beef and the purchase of processed beef um, uh, in the UK and indeed more broadly across Europe. So, 
the, you know, this is going to need to feed into, I think, um, a set of pretty far-reaching uh, implications and conclusions. Um, it hasn't been put together um, in an integrated way yet, and I think it's going to take some time before that will emerge. But when it does, some of the elements of the solution, I think, will be as follows. Uh, the first is uh, the regulatory context. These types of challenges cannot be dealt with by individual member states in Europe. They will require um, an EU-wide solution. They'll require a solution in terms of common standards, common testing protocols, um, and common enforcement um, where there have been breaches of those. But very importantly, there's going to need, be a need for some thought leadership around what all this means as well that I think will need to come uh, from a European context. Um, secondly, testing is here to stay. Um, I think that's a good thing. I think consumers deserve it. Um, clearly, there's going to the massive level of testing, which um, is 50-fold um, at the moment versus where it would have been pre-January across Europe. Um, it won't endure at that level, um, but you will continue to see species testing um, appropriately so for some time, and that will build cost into the food supply chain permanently. Um, I think you will see changes in manufacturing practice, and very importantly, you'll see changes in supply chains. So there will be a pretty dramatic simplification of food supply chains will unfold here. And you'll see the removal of brokers. You'll see tighter connections from uh, consumers right the way back to specific farms. And the food industry is going to have to configure around that. Um, and I then think you will also see a move to local. So you're going to see new product development. And the focus of that is going to connect um, local uh, farms much more to, to local consumption. It can't do that entirely because the uh, supply and demand dynamics don't allow that, um, but you're going to see some changes there. And then you'll get to a stage, very, very legitimately, where um, uh, food uh, will quite rightly be exactly what it says on the packet. And I think you'll begin to see that, first of all, unfold in compliance, um, but secondly, unfold in terms of marketing and consumer communication. I think that will be important. So all, all of that, I think, will change. But there's some things that shouldn't change. Um, and there's some important uh, context to this, too. Um, uh, the first is that while this has been dramatic, and I think there has been a sense of hysteria about it, the actual test results taken um, specifically and in aggregate are quite encouraging. So 99.5% of all of the beef products tested in Britain, the 5,000 tests over the last month, have come back negative for the presence of equine DNA. This is not actually a pervasive issue. Um, but where it, is, where it does exist, it must be rooted out. And one thing I would say, and which I take no consolation, is where, uh, where commentators um, and governments have said, well, at least this isn't a food safety issue, I think they missed the point. The point is there is stuff in food that shouldn't be there, and we need to get it out. Um, it just so happens that it's safe, but that, I can assure you, is only a coincidence. Um, I think, but I think that sense of context around, um, around where we are, um, I think, is important. The second thing that we, should, um, uh, that we should recognize is, despite the current challenges, in human history, food has never been more traceable, safer, um, or more accurately processed than it is today. This is a problem, um, but it's a problem in an industry that has got progressively better for a very, very long period of time. And while doing all of that, has been progressively more uh, price competitive for consumers and has enabled protein consumption to be delivered much more pervasively across uh, the world than ever before. Um, and you know, there's, there's lots of ways in which I could illustrate that, but probably the simplest is to say, when I was born in 1970, 20% of GDP of developed countries was spent on food. Today, 8% is. And um, that's the scale of the um, efficiency and cost competitiveness that the global food industry um, has been able to deliver. And we shouldn't forget that, because in the rush to respond to the specific and legitimate concerns, a lot of the solutions in the near term will default to, uh, to local sourcing, which will be more expensive. Um, and that will leave, uh, pro make protein consumption harder for many parts of the world and for many consumers um, who are under pressure, particularly in these uh, tough economic times. Um, and we, you know, we need to remember that protein consumption for them is important too. So, <clears throat> so that, that, I think, is is, is how I think about the, uh, the food industry. There's, there's another just interesting observation that I, that I might finish with, which is that um, what's, what has unfolded over the last six or seven weeks, I think will become increasingly relevant to how Britain thinks about itself and how Britain thinks about its position in the European Union. Um, the, the axis of change that is driving EU regulation in food right now um, is being driven by Britain and Ireland. Um, and it's been driven by Britain and Ireland together 
um, in a way that will benefit all of Europe. Um, and it's a little ironic, actually, uh, that perhaps the, mo the, uh, the most perceived Eurosceptical member of the British cabinet is the person who's adopting the most pro-European policies and driving this through right now. Um, and I think you'll, um, you know, this handling of this and the solution to this, which cannot exist uh, within an individual country, is an interesting case study, I think, as Britain reflects on it in time, that will be relevant to how it thinks about Europe. Um, and it's also uh, crystal clear to us, um, as I think about the, um, the food industry, that, you know, Britain's posture towards Europe and Britain's presence in the European Union is absolutely vital uh, to the Irish food industry um, as, as we go forward. We export about four billion pounds, um, our four billion euros worth of product into Britain every year, and we buy about three billion pounds of food uh, from, uh, from Britain each year. It's no surprise to anyone, I suspect, that, we are, that Britain is our biggest market for food. It may well be a surprise for you to know that Ireland is Britain's biggest export market for food. So the trade links between the two countries in relation to food um, are absolutely critical. And I think as Britain has a debate with itself around its role in Europe, I think we have a very, very important stake in that. And I think what, you know, what this uh, near-term crisis has taught us is that Britain can have that debate with itself, but it can't have it just with itself um, as it goes forward. And I think we need to find the right dialogue and the right way of engaging as employers in Britain, like Green Corps is, um, but as stakeholders in Britain's um, uh, consideration of this issue, which I think the entire Irish economy and Irish state is. So um, we certainly will be playing in Green Corps um, our part in, in that debate. So thank you very much for listening to me, um, and I look forward to participating in the Q&A.